Good afternoon and welcome. Come on in. It's, this is like a, a reunion here at uh, the Syracuse COE. We have folks coming into the room. We also have folks joining us on online. We had this morning. You can't hear me. So how about the people online? How what mic will pick me up for the people online? So one in the middle of the room. Use them all. <laughs> So, good afternoon and welcome. I'm, I'm Ed Bogish. I'm the executive director of Syracuse COE. We're New York State Center of Excellence in Environmental and Energy Systems. It's my pleasure to welcome folks who are here at Syracuse COE in the room to our monthly research and technology forum and also folks who are uh, listening and watching online. Uh, so, online we're streaming the audio and the slides uh, from the from the presentation and if the folks who are joining us online have uh, have questions you can use the chat box and the um, on the interface to give give questions and we'll relay them into the room we do have folks uh, across the country and even around the world uh, that we're expecting to tune tune in uh, via via the webinar, and we wel welcome them all, and we welcome folks in the room. This is a it's a great day for us, a great day of celebration and recognizing the success of uh, of a team that's been working diligently for three years on a on a very creative idea, and in particular, we recognize and celebrate the leader of that team, Professor Khalifa, uh, who is. Uh, in at least double overtime or triple overtime in his position at uh, at Syracuse University and is looking forward to retirement for sure on June 30th, <laughs> 2018. I think this is like three times deferred. So, um, so this afternoon we have three presentations, Professor Khalifa, um, Bill Bush, and Mike Wetzel. Each will talk about uh, uh, their contributions to the development of uh, the micro environmental control system that uh, that they'll describe. I'll introduce each speaker. Uh, I think after each one, maybe we can ask short questions about their presentations. Okay, quite questions at at the end after every every. So dur during presentation, if anyone has clar clarifying questions, you can feel free to raise them. So um, starting with doc Dr. Khalifa. So Dr. Khalifa was recruited to uh, be a faculty member at Syracuse University in, uh, in 2001. He is the NYSTAR Distinguished Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Uh, he's the originator, the inventor, and the PI of the micro environmental control system concept. He's also done many other things here at, at Syracuse University, including being the um, vi visionary who envisioned the um, energy system that was installed at uh, Syracuse University's Green Green Data Center. But um, prior to uh, coming to Syracuse University, Dr. Khalifa 
uh, served 23 years at United Technologies Corporation at both United Technologies Research Center and also a period of time when he was director of engineering for the Carlisle, for the carrier, for carriers Carlisle compressor division, where he oversaw all aspects of the development and reliability of vapor compressors for air conditioning and refrigeration. Holds a PhD from Brown University, and he's a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and ASHRAE. Professor Khalifa. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ed, and thank you very much for joining us today. Okay. Uh, before I talk about the micro environmental control system, which is the subject uh, that, uh, that Ed talked about, I'd like to introduce a uh, sort of an overview of a, uh, a class of systems we call it personal environmental control systems, of which the micro environmental control system is a prominent one. <clears throat> so my presentation, I'll talk about something we call the personal microenvironment. Okay? Uh, then I'll define what these PECs or personal environmental control systems are and talk about the benefits, show you examples of the existing ones, then uh, switch gears and start talking uh, more in depth about the micro environmental control system, which is the uh, the centerpiece of this presentation, okay? Uh, following me, uh, uh, Bill Bosch will be talking about the heart of that environmental control system, microenvironmental control system. It's a very tiny scroll compressor that was developed especially for this application, unlike any other compressor in the world, okay? Then we will conclude with a presentation from Mike Wetzel, who will talk about the uh, transferring this technology to the market and commercialization by air innovations. Uh, obviously this guy, the astronaut, has his own micro environmental control system, okay? He's isolated from the rest of the world and he has an, a control system that controls the temperature and the humidity and the quality of the air he breathes and everything else, <clears throat> okay? So he has a micro environment around him, okay? But the question is, what about us, people on Earth? It turns out okay, that each one of us is surrounded by a microenvironment. Okay? Uh, these pictures actually show this microenvironment. It's a natural convection plume around the person. Okay? Pictures were taken using Schlieren technology by Professor Gary Settles at Pennsylvania State University. Okay? As you can see, there's a plume around the person. Okay? That plume is very close to the person and that's what you sense. That's what you breathe and that's what you sense. It's affected by you and you are affected by it. So what are they? Okay. Uh, these are systems that condition the micro environment around the person. If you look at a building like this, you may have a small number of thermostats. Each one of them is controlling the conditions in a zone. Okay. But what we sense is this environment immediately around us, okay? So PECs are systems that condition the micro, the personal micro environment around a person, okay? Rather than the environment in the entire building or entire zone, okay? They include a variety of things, personalized ventilation systems, okay? Uh, we have a bunch of those here on the fifth floor uh, of this building in the TIEQ, the carrier TIEQ. And we have actually deployed, okay, uh, P Peter King is sitting there. We had deployed 37 or 38 of those at uh, King & King Architect. And they've been there for about three or four years. Yeah. At least, okay. Uh, uh, they include local thermal management systems. Okay, uh, The LTMS is a, is a, uh, a name uh, used by the Department of Energy, RPE, okay. Uh, these condition the thermal environment around a person. Uh, both of them can be either stationary, like attached to furniture or sitting under a desk, or they may be portable, okay? If you're wearing a jacket that will keep you cool outside, you know, the, you can buy these jackets, the people who are working on the roads on hot climates you know, wear these jackets, you are essentially wearing 
a personal environmental control system, okay, that conditioned the environment around your body. Okay, when you were, wear a parka or a heavy sweater, you're trying to condition the environment around your body. Yeah. They all fall under this general class of distributed environmental control system because they're not centralized, they are where people are. Now, why, why control okay, the personal microenvironment instead of the entire building? Okay. <coughs> Our health and comfort are actually determined by what is inside that personal microenvironment. Condition in the microenvironment are oftentimes very different from the conditions in the general <clears throat> building. Okay? Uh, this includes issues like exposure to harm of harmful contaminants, include the issues of thermal comfort, perceived air quality. Okay? Controlling the microenvironment around a person is more effective okay, than controlling the general environment. Okay? And actually, it also saves energy. Okay, individual control of the personal microenvironment has been shown to improve comfort, satisfaction, and productivity. There are lots of studies uh, to that effect. Now, if you look at the way people design buildings, okay, there's an Ashley standard called Ashley Standard 55 that dictates the conditions uh, that you want to maintain in the building to keep people comfortable, thermally comfortable. And oftentimes these are the are, are, are selected so that no more than 20% of the people are dissatisfied. Okay. So 20% is a very large number. Okay. However, controlling the environment in a big space like this or bigger okay, uh, does not guarantee that the environment around me or around you is satisfactory to me or to you. Okay. The standard may not be satisfied everywhere or at any every time in the building. Okay. Indoor conditions are non-uniform in the building. Okay? If you are close to a cold window, you're not going to be the same as being in the core of a building. Okay? Individual <clears throat> occupants have different preferences. I'm from Egypt. I probably want it to be a little warmer than somebody from Sweden. Okay? Uh, so what we need to do is to control the conditions in the individual's personal microenvironment, not the average conditions in the entire building. Okay? This will deliver local comfort as well as save energy. So obviously for DOE, the important thing is the issue of saving energy. Okay. Uh, we have actually advocated this concept for a very, very long time. This picture dates back to 2003. Okay. We have come up with this concept is there is a person in the microenvironment, that microenvironment is interacting, say, with the building environment to the roof environment, which is interacting with the outdoor environment. All of these things are linked through flows of energy and contaminants and mass and, and information, okay? So, a PECS or a personal environmental control system is the system that controls that microenvironment, okay? It has to interact with the rest of the building uh, environmental control system, what we call the HVAC system, okay, but it gives you uh, uh, granularity in controlling the environment around the person and actually can have the person customize the environment according to their own conditions. Now, about the energy savings, uh, DOE, based on studies done at the University of California at Berkeley, at the uh, Center for the Built Environment, okay, have done a study, and they concluded that if you were to take a building and widen the thermostat set point range, okay, by a few degrees on the high side and the low side, you can save a lot of energy. Okay. They estimated that you can save more than 2% of the total US energy of everybody raise the thermostat to by four degrees in the summer and lower the thermostat by four degrees in the winter. This is a huge amount. It translates into 1.8 quads of energy every year. Now, of course, assumption here that every man, woman, and child will do this, okay? But that's sort of what motivates the Department of Energy. I think uh, uh, Professor Schiff is here and he had been a program director at the Department of Energy and he can tell you about what motivates the Department of Energy, ARPA-E? I think energy savings 
of this magnitude or higher is what motivates these various uh, projects that they uh, undertake. Uh, so uh, they have a goal of let's take the thermostat in the summer and raise it from 75 to 79 degrees and lower the temperature in the winter from typical 70 degrees to 66. If you do this, you save all that energy. But what's the downside of this? Okay. If I raise the temperature in the summer, not 20%, a lot more than 20% of the people will be unhappy. And if I lower it in the winter, Okay. They're going to be unhappy or worse, they're going to go get these electric heaters and put them under their desk and use a lot of energy. Okay. So what we need is to find an efficient way of conditioning the environment around a person so that the person will be comfortable and productive even when the room conditions are not comfortable, they're being made uncomfortable to save energy. Okay. Examples of these specs. There are lots of them, but many of them did not okay, succeed commercially. Uh, most of them relied on access to air. So they are either connected to an underfloor plenum or, con or receiving air from the ceiling or just blowing air without changing its temperature. Uh, there was Johnson Controls PEM, okay, uh, that was discontinued. It was very complex, was discontinued, and I believe the unit that you make, uh, Mike, is sort of the successor of this. So it survived in a different format made by our own air innovations, okay, as used for mission critical applications, okay. Uh, there is the exhaust to personal ventilation system, the one I was talking about, the one we have on the fifth floor in the TIQ here and the ones we installed at King & King uh, more than four years ago. Okay. And we actually tested it and, okay, I take it your engineers, uh, architects were happy with it. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, this one has to be either connected to a source of, of cool air. In the case of King & King, we had a ductless system because they have a displacement ventilation system where the uh, conditioned air is sort of spilled close to the ground okay, from diffusers and partitions between the, uh, the <coughs> offices, the desks. Okay? So we put that box that has a fan that would pick up this air and blow it through that personal ventilation system. Okay? That was a version of the exhaust okay, unit. The exhaust is a company in Denmark okay? um, that uh, does not require connection but requires that box that will suck the air and blow it on the people. It was also discontinued. Then there is uh, that system called the Ziffer D-TAC ductless task air conditioning. Okay. It used an inefficient thermoelectric cooling things that has a COP of 0.2. If the COP is 0.2 then you're rejecting a lot more heat than the heat you're pulling from the space. What they did is they used a thermal storage module, a phase change material to store the rejected heat. Because the COP is very low, they need a lot of that phase change material to store the amount of energy rejected. Okay? In fact, okay, in order for them to do what our system that I'm going to be talking about can do, it's not going to be that small, it's going to be five times or six times as big as what you see on the picture at the bottom there. Okay? This, um, this then there are many others, okay? Uh, so, okay, some observations about these available ones. Most of them require connection to the building air distribution system, okay? Which makes them not very suitable for retrofit, okay? Uh, it's easier done if the, if the air is coming from, from underfloor, if you have underfloor plenum as we have in this building. But the number of buildings that have underfloor ventilation in the US is very limited. And in Europe, even is small, but it's, it's increasing. Okay, uh, it's very messy if you have to bring ducts from the ceiling where most of the air distribution comes from to the individual offices. Okay, uh, some require major infrastructure changes. Okay, right, uh, require your own ducting system. Some require changes in the furniture. Okay, uh, and uh, some just blow room air without cooling it. Right, like a fan will do that. Okay. 
and I can put a fan, a disc fan, I will blow air, I will cool you, okay? Uh, then many are aimed at improving air quality, not necessarily at uh, enhancing thermal comfort. And very few consider the energy implications of the use of these units. And we introduced our micro-environmental control system, which is a brand new approach for uh, PECS. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about. This was a collaborative effort and could not have been successful without the collaboration of people who are quite different. In fact, we have engineers, we have manufacturing engineers, design engineers, we have people who do computations, we have people who do design, <coughs> industrial design, okay? And we have people who are psychologists in our team, okay? So it was an integrated team with cross-disciplinary capabilities that were necessary for uh, doing something like this. Okay? Uh, the team was led by Syracuse University. We have as uh, our team members, United Technologies Research Center, uh, Fred Cogswell, Dr. Fred Cogswell is sitting there. He's from United Technologies Research Center. Okay, we have Air Innovation. Uh, Mr. Mike Wetzel is here. So is David Martini from Air Innovations. Okay, uh, Bush Technical. We, the principal of Bush Technical is right there, and Cornell University, whom we engage for doing human subject testing to see whether indeed these things, these units, can restore comfort when the room temperature is high. I would ask all the team members, anybody who worked in this project, please stand up. <laughs> Working. Brian. Uh -huh. So you can see, and this is not all the team, okay? There are many others who could not be with us, okay? So as you can see, okay, a very large team with complementary capabilities. So what is that, that Mio X? We call it Mio X because Mio for micro and X ECS, environmental control system, X, okay? Uh, it's a near-term personal environmental control system, okay? Compromises a number of innovations. It has a micro-vapor compression that's capable of delivering only about 60 or more, 60 or 70 watts of cooling, okay? To freeze a phase change material at night. To give you an idea about the size of this, a very small window air conditioner will deliver 1,500 watts of cooling. This one delivers 70, 75, 60 watts of cooling. <clears throat> a high-performance microscope compressor. It's the smallest of its kind. Okay, Bill Bush will be talking about this. It was designed and uh, developed especially for this application. Okay, it has a novel evaporator that's embedded in a phase change material that melts at around 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Phase change material goes from solid to liquid and liquid to solid, sort of like wax, but it melts and freezes at 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Um, it, it has automation, can actually operate automatically at night to freeze the phase change material, then can start automatically during the day when a person is sitting at the desk. When the person is sitting at the desk, all you're doing is you have a one watt fan blowing cold air on, on the person and keeping that person comfortable in a room that is at 79, actually we did also 83 degrees, okay? Uh, that uh, air management system is designed to remove 50 watts, okay, from the air, cool the air by about 50 watts of cooling. That's 50 watts thermal, it's not 50 watts electric. The actual energy consumption, electric consumption of that unit is only 10 watts at night and one watt during the day, okay? That makes it eminently suitable for making a portable system running on batteries, for example, okay? And has uh, an optional uh, heat delivery device that provides about 60 watts of heating for winter conditions. So, some of its attributes. It delivers about 500 watt hours of cooling during the day. I'm using SI units, uh, Système International, okay? uh, 
a kilowatt hour is 3,400 BTUs. Okay, so. Uh, so 500 watt hours of cooling or about 600 watt hours of heating in the re near range micro environment. Okay, this is to keep a person comfortable in a room that has been elevated to 79 degrees or higher in the summer or 66 degrees or lower in the winter. It consumes less than 100 watt hours for that entire cycle of day and night. Okay. Uh, one of the uh, criteria for whether this will make a person comfortable is a criterion that was introduced by the Department of Energy, ARPA-E. Okay? They figure that if you raise the temperature in the room to 79, from 75 to 79 degrees, the ability of your body to dissipate the body heat. A person, a typical person sitting at a desk doing office work will be dissipating about 105 watts. Okay, like a big incandescent lamp, okay? You have to remove that heat from the body or you're gonna get a heat stroke, okay? There are three ways of removing the heat from the body. There's convection, okay, into the air surrounding you. You all notice that in the Schlieren picture I showed at the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the seminar, I showed this thermal plume around the body, okay, that's convection around the body. Your body is warmer than the space, so you have the chimney effect, you know? Or you could be blowing air on the people. The other method is to radiate to the enclosure of the building. And the third method is to sweat, okay? On the average, now one third, one third, one third. They're not exactly this, but on the average is one third, one third, one third. If you raise the temperature in the room, you are decreasing the radiation heat loss and you're decreasing the convection heat loss. So to, for your body to dissipate the same amount of heat, you have to sweat. And when you sweat, you feel uncomfortable, okay? So DOE estimated that in order to restore comfort when the room is at 79 instead of 75 degrees, we have to remove from the human body an additional 23 watts or more. So we designed our system okay, to remove from the body more than 23 watts when the room temperature is elevated to 79 degrees. Actually, it does a lot more than this, as I'll say. Okay? And our system complies with all ergonomic and safety standards. <coughs> all we need, the system sitting in front of you, can see our latest prototype sitting in front of okay, in front of you right right there. Okay, that's the unit that sits under the desk. The bulk of the unit is that thermal storage battery. Okay, the actual compressor, as you'll see, is very tiny. It's about the size of an apple. Uh -huh. uh, so, all you need to do is to plug it in the wall. You don't have to connect it to a duct. You don't have to connect it to the floor. You don't have to okay. Uh, uh, you may want to connect it to the desk to deliver the air, or you may want to integrate it with a desk. Like if a furniture manufacturer wants to integrate this unit to the desk, that's another approach. And in fact, I think when Mike speaks, that's a possible uh, 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 sales path. <coughs> In very simple flow diagram, it looks like any vapor compression system. There is a compressor. Okay, there's a condenser, we blow air on the condenser, this is at night, there's an expansion valve, and there's an evaporator. The major differences would be, this evaporator is embedded in a phase change material, so as you can see here. So that's one of the innovations in that system. Okay, so I will not talk about all the ordinary uh, conventional pieces of equipment in the system. I'll talk about this particular one. The other major innovation of the system is the microcompressor. So Bill will speak about the microcompressor. I'll speak about that PCM evaporator. Here's the system. And next to it is sort of an industrial design of how the system will fit under a desk. Uh, there's no guarantee it's going to look like that, okay? But that's sort of a concept, okay? And Mike will talk a lot more about 
how will that system be used in a desk in, a, in an office environment the uh, PCM heat exchanger has a tube that carries a refrigerant that coming from the vapor compression system okay we selected a refrigerant that has one of the lowest global warming potentials of the refrigerants currently available okay uh, so it's not it's a brand new refrigerant that's not widely used i think it's used mostly in large centrifugal compressors brand new ones not the existing ones okay so you circulate that refrigerant inside the port. it's a flat tube okay with lots of ports in it so it zigzags from and exits, enters here and exits there. Surrounding it is the PCM. Okay. When we start the refrigerant, it's cold. It's coming uh, from the expansion valve. <coughs> it is at a lower tension, lower than the freezing point of the PCM. Okay. I don't know what to. Let me go back. So you can see it freezing here. So when it freezes, it looks like a wax. As you can see here, this is not real time. Right? This is uh, this is accelerated. Okay, it actually takes about seven hours in that picture. Okay, so this was taken over about seven hours. We actually designing the system. The low low capacity is is an advantage in freezing it slowly at night. Okay, so in the real system, we're gonna you can freeze it with this compressor in about nine hours or ten hours. Okay, so here it is. Now, the key to this is there's no such evaporator. Nothing like this exists anywhere. So we had to actually develop the design tools, the modeling software to design this. Okay. So this is okay, our uh, design simulation of computer program that we created to show how the thing freezes. When it becomes white, it means it's fully frozen. When it is uh, purple or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, plum colored like this, uh, it means it's still liquid. So you can see again, it's freezing from the top to the bottom. And this, this one is taking about 10 hours to freeze. Okay. Uh, here's another comparison. This is the melting. Again, our model compared with the experimental results that we measured. So we have confidence in these tools that we developed both here and at United Technologies Research Center for designing and developing and predicting the performance of these, uh, these systems. Okay. This is the melting, okay? The heat exchanger is actually made of slabs. Each one of them has one of these coils. So the design we have currently here has four of these slabs. They look like pizza boxes about one inch wide, okay? about 40 centimeters tall, and about 40 centimeters uh, width. You can see the top of this, this thing. The one that uh, Mike and uh, Dave are designing will have three slabs, for example. There's no magical number. Uh, that can actually do it with three slabs, with six slabs. I think the first one you did, uh, Brian, may have had six slabs in it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So and you can see that okay, the uh, the uh, the picture on the on the side here shows the progression of the cooling break when air is blown on the PCM to be cooled mm -hmm. by the melting uh, PCM. In addition to this work, we did also mannequin testing to verify that we are able to remove at least 23 watts. Okay, Meng King, Dr. Meng King, sitting in the back, he did that, uh, that th these experiments. Okay, that mannequin is a very expensive mannequin. It costs us $170,000 to buy this mannequin. Okay, it's not just a mannequin like the one you'll find in display cases showing. I don't know. Uh, clothes and stuff like this. This is a very sophisticated mannequin where it has 19 sections. Each one of them is individually controlled. Yeah. So these are some of the results from the mannequin. Uh, the numbers you see on the horizontal axis are the location of the mannequin. Uh, we figured that a person sitting at a desk will move within a semicircle that's about two feet in radius. Okay. So when you see 61, zero and 61 means the person is sitting directly in front of the diffuser and moving two feet back from the desk, okay? Uh, when it's point 0.2, means uh, closer to the desk. When it's point 0.3 and point 0.5, it means it's somewhere on the side, okay? Uh, away from where the diffuser is. The dash line is the minimum required, which is the 23 watts. And the uh, bars are actual test results showing that our system as designed more than, okay, meets the minimum requirement, okay, uh, to keep a person comfortable in a warm room. 
the important thing is that's all okay, based on physics and thermodynamics and all of this. The test that will reveal whether actually you're going to improve comfort will be to test with humans, okay? which is what we did. So we uh, conducted some testing at Cornell with some four units there. Okay, and we tested a large number of people, I think 59, but uh, 43 subjects, okay, uh, the tests were, okay, uh, there were no errors in the tests, okay. Uh, as you can see, uh, the vertical scale there is the ASHRAE thermal sensation volt, okay. Three will be hot, zero will be neutral, minus three will be cold, then you have cool and, okay, and slightly cool and cool and the negative scale. Okay, and you're going to have slightly warm and warm and hot okay, on the vertical scale. So as you can see, the unit definitely shifts toward cooling. However, as you see, is a person without the unit is neutral. Okay? And the reason for this is when we did the test, we assumed that the person will be totally stationary, like essentially doing nothing. They're not walking. They're not doing anything. They're not shuffling their feet. Okay, so we're going to repeat the test here. Okay, where we're going to allow the people to do a little bit of walking to simulate uh, a higher met rate than just somebody <coughs> sitting there and just typing on a keyboard. Uh, we did also uh, testing, human subject testing of the, uh, of the heating system. Okay? It's a foot warmer. Okay? Uh, you can see Chetna sitting in one of the cubicles with the foot warmer on her desk. Okay, and here we have eight of these units, so we tested 31 subjects, and indeed, the shift again is toward uh, more comfortable or less uncomfortable, okay, as you can see in this particular case. So just a concluding remarks, what's next? Okay, we received also co-funding, okay, in addition to the large amount of funding we received from DOE, $3.2 million, plus $320,000 from NYSERDA, plus cost share from all our partners. Okay. Uh, we also received $400,000 from NYSERDA. The interest is somewhat different. It's not energy savings, it's demand reduction, electric demand reduction. In New York City, they're talking about closing a power plant on the Hudson River, the Indian Point power plant, that provides one-third of the electricity to New York City. Okay. You're not going to go and build another power plant in any short time. Okay, so conservation and reduction in demand is crucial. The peak demand tends to be in the summer months in the afternoon, between two and six in the afternoon on the summer months. So because our system shifts the cooling to the night, you can raise the temperature in the afternoon of the summer months and reduce the consumption of electricity by the HVAC system in the building and use the stored energy that's available through this device to keep the people comfortable when you raise the temperature. But the purpose here is reducing electric demand, peak electric demand. Okay? Then we are also looking at additional potential applications for our high-performance microcompressor, scroll compressor, and Bill will be talking about this. Then air innovation is in the process of designing a design for manufacturing version of this unit okay, uh, to be suitable for uh, early introduction okay, and Mike will be talking about this. Thank you very much. So I'm pleased to introduce Bill Bush who's up, up next. Um, what is a bio of Bill? It's worth reading. Um, he's been working in the field of electromechanical machine design and manufacturing for 40 years with a focus on compression machinery for air, natural gas, and refrigerants. Bill is presently the principal of Bush Technical. Just saying, Bill retired and <laughs> He, he got itchy, <laughs> so he started his own company, Bush Technical, which provides technical services in a number of fields, including the development of the miniature scroll <laughs> compressor in, in this project we just heard about. 
Bill has led or participated in the launch of 11 different products which have come to market. He recently played a lead role in the clean paper, ground up design, develop, development and production launch of a line of scroll compressors for the commercial air conditioning and heat pump industry. Bill is the named inventor or co-inventor of 117 US patents in this field. He's the author of 16 technical pu publications. He received his master's degree in mechanical engineering from Tennessee Technological University with an emphasis on engineering acoustics and machine design. Serves an, as an adjunct professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at, at Syracuse University. Bill Bush. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so does this work? Cool. Okay. Now, can I step away from here? No, then that's why. So, well, you can. The way people on the web can do it. Does the hand microphone do it? Can you work? I think I was told that it works. I'll, I'll, tell you what, I'll see if I can work from here. We'll see how it goes. So, I'll keep this handy. Uh, you know, I've, I've got to start this out by telling a story I've told this a number of times. I, I'll tell it to you all here. Is that uh, uh, Dr. Cleef first approached me, I think, in 2014. I think 2014, 15. About, about, about mid late 2014, about this project. And he wanted a, a small scroll compressor, about a 1.5 cubic centimeter displacement, which is about that big, uh, with about 10 watt power consumption. <clears throat> and, my comment, and my comment to him at the time was I uh, quote you, don't waste your time with it. Okay. If I look at all the scaling relationships between displacements and leakage areas and mechanical losses, uh, you're much better off to go with a simpler mechanism, a simpler device, like a, like a rolling piston machine, such as the Aspen compressor. And he, he came back to me and said, no, no, this is, a, this is supposed to be a far out project. We're supposed to be you know, testing the limits, see where we can push us out to. And I said, well, okay, it's, you know, it's your money, I'll, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> and and just, just the presence here tells you that it, it worked out very, very well, beyond, beyond anything I imagined. But uh, we're gonna talk about that here. Uh, we had our first meeting, I don't know if the project before we started yet or not, it was in April, I think it was in this room here. And uh, we were doing the presentation and I'd, I'd already started looking at the compressor design and I, I, had, I, I, was, I had like six, six slides were packed full of words, no pictures, we're sitting here, I was watching the other presentations and I remember, uh, but, you know, I really need a picture for this to talk about what I'm doing and, and I'm sitting right there, I drew a picture on a piece of paper, took a cell phone picture and texted it to Chet, and then she put it into the slide deck for me before I got up. So this is the first. This is the first diagram we had of the of the design concept. Uh, I'll talk later about some of the intellectual property. Right now, we're looking at potentially five separate inventions. Two of them are already in this sketch here, and more will be showed up a bit later. But that's when that's when design really first started moving. It's in April of that year. By October. Six months later, and that six months included about three months working as a camp director, so it wasn't really full time. Uh, it had a, had a final design layout. It had a detailed engineering analysis. Uh, we had our motor selected. I'd like to thank, uh, if he was here, Tim Labresh for having a, a big role in, in making that happen. And the machine was pretty much designed on paper. And I, and I, I detailed engineering sketches of everything. Uh, a few months after that, I think uh, Brian, are you? Brian's here. Uh, we uh, turned that into about three months. Turned that into a detailed uh, CAD mod, set of CAD models with fully detailed drawings. And ready, ready to go out and buy parts, which we did. And uh, just a few months after that, we, we identified our suppliers, we purchased parts, and by June of that year, we had the first compressors on test on our stand that's a couple floors up here. And so, total, you know, looking from April to June, uh, you know, 14, 14 months from a napkin sketch to, uh, to compressor on test. And so, and, and that was, that was as far as anybody. That we did get the level of performance that we uh, that we achieved, okay, and actually, and I'll we'll, we'll show it here, but it's it's actually better than we had had required or even hoped for. So, so that, that's that's how the compressor got launched launched uh, initially. A year after that, this is June of 2017. Uh, we learned our lesson testing. Our, we built three prototypes at first. We learned a lot from those, and from that, we made a few design changes. We uh, Procured eight more compressors, which you see on the bench getting ready to be built. And uh, so far, we've tested a total of 12 scroll sets, 11 running gear, 
12 scroll sets. Every single one of them has demonstrated very good performance, meeting or exceeding the project requirements. Uh, we've been through some unplanned reliability tests, primarily loss of lubrication or a loss of flow, and the compressors hold it very well to that. We haven't, uh, the only components I've damaged so far on these types of abuse conditions have been inexpensive replaceable components. And we have some strategies. I talked to some of you before the meeting. Uh, there are some strategies we can adopt to even avoid that type of issue with the compressor. So up, up to this point, we've been very fortunate and very, uh, very pleased, very pleased with the performance of the compressor. Uh, specifically, if we talk about the performance, the, uh, the program requirement was for the minimum COB coefficient performance of uh, 5.7. And I think in, in every single case we've exceeded uh, low, the low sixes. I think our highs have been as high as 6.7. I recall 6.6, 6.7. But all, all total scroll sets, every single compressor we tested has exceeded the requirement for the logic. Uh, this particular, the particular chart I'm showing you here, uh, this is a test that ran a little, some, a little while ago, but ran a number of different speeds of the compressor. I'm looking ahead now to uh, capacity modulation in the machine by changing the refrigerant flow. And in this case, I think we ran this over a 20% variation in capacity. And you can see that here. You see with the cooling capacity of the compressor, you step it up, so you step the speed up. As you might expect, the compressor power consumption is stepping up as we do that. Uh, but the coefficient of performance, the efficiency stays fairly flat. So I can speed this thing up, I slow it down, and I still get about the same effectiveness, the same efficiency of, of cooling. Uh, well, I'm also one point out here, we'll talk about that in a minute. Even with the speed range, we look at the compressor power consumption of 10 to 12 watts. And it's not uh, actually 10 to 11 watts, I'm sorry. We run some more test systems when we run higher conditions, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And the compressor is very, very smooth, very well balanced, it's very quiet. Uh, many times I walk in while I'm running tests on the compressor, and I walk up to the stand, it's running, and I put my hand on to see if I can actually feel any kind of vibration or buzzing from it. Uh, so it's, we're very pleased with that aspect of it also. What this, what this comes, brings to mind now, uh, the fact that our power consumption is so low and the fact that the cooling performance is so consistent and, and, and so reliable is we start to think about uh, battery-powered applications. I think, Dr. Cleef, you mentioned that briefly a bit earlier. We're now looking at portable systems. I want a system that I can carry around with me and wear on my back or on my belt. Uh, if you, uh, and we talk about the, the wearable chiller, little chiller system. Uh, you saw the picture of the astronaut a little while ago in a spacesuit, you know, flying out of space <coughs> in his uh, rocket chair. Well, underneath that spacesuit, he's wearing undergarment, kind of covers the middle part of the torso and upper legs. And it's, it's, like, it's like a onesie piece of underwear, it's full of tubes. And the way they control that microenvironment inside that space is to circulate water through that garment. And they have their own system. that actually the venting water in space to provide the cooling. But the fact is, the personal environment is controlled by this wearable garment that requires cool water to be circulated through it. Uh, if I can, if we put together, we're looking at a small, small integrated <coughs> system. We're now going to replace this PC and evaporator with a conventional water cool. Chill a barrel, very small, with circulation pump. Now I can put this on and wear this on my belt. It's a little bit of a little thing. It might be somewhere in the order of uh, maybe five pounds, eight pounds, something less than 10 pounds. And I can run that thing, provide cool water. And I can wear that uh, in Sahara. I can wear it in a hot environment, any kind of hot environment. I can wear it in isolation suits. I've approached about the whole point is to make it stay portable. I've got a list of, I've had various, talked to various people, some have approached me, I've approached some of them about various applications, possibilities. Uh, there are more out there, but there is definitely a, a need for this. You can you can buy these vests today. If you go on the internet, you can, you can Google them up and you can find you can buy the vest right now. Uh, but almost, almost without exception, the way they're operated is you have this little thing you carry along with you, it's got a big block of ice in it. Of water. They circulate water through that and melt the ice to circulate through the vest. Uh, when you see the astronauts walking onto the space shuttle, okay, they take off and they carry a little suitcase with them. That's what's in it. It's 
or twice. Here's their clear part. They hand that out of the craft and they plug into the system, the uh, spacecraft system, and they keep on going. So what I'm looking at here is something that's electrically powered. I do not need to replenish it with ice. I need to recharge the battery. Uh, if I'm out in uh, Nigeria somewhere or in the sub-Saharan desert and I need to uh, keep cool, I can't always freeze a block of ice. I may not have the power to do that. I may not have the facility to do it. But any place I can put up a solar panel, I can recharge the battery. And the level of power consumption we're looking at with the power consumption we're looking at, if I if I allow myself to double, if I double the power consumption, considering that I'm running now at a higher condensing temperature than this internal indoor system. Okay, so I double my power requirement to do the cooling, I've got a circulation pump, I've got to manage it. If it doubles, I can carry a laptop battery and a quarter of this battery at 80 watt hours power here. I can run this thing for four hours on this battery. If I'm too optimistic if something else, if Murphy crops up and I'm drawing quadruple the power, I still run for two hours on that. As opposed to having to carry around about 8 to 10, 12, 14 pounds of ice and recharge it every few hours also. <clears throat> so this, this is the part that gets fairly exciting to us, is uh, this environmental, personal environmental system at the desk is, is the enabling product that brought this, that really brought the uh, development to the state it's at. But if I look ahead to future applications, the fact that we had this very, very stringent efficiency requirement and that we actually achieved it and exceeded it tells me we can run this thing off the battery. A very small, relatively small battery for quite a long time. It provided us now not just a desk, but you can walk around outside, walk around in the desert, walk around in your nuclear containment vessel, walk wherever you want, and be able to uh, provide some degree of cooling. I actually had one uh, and one of the companies, I had somebody from NASA actually approach and say, hey, we'd like to use this on Mars. Was it Mars? <laughs> because, okay, the guy floating around in the space suit, out in, the, out in the space on his rocket chair, uh, what they're doing is they're venting water into space. And when they do that, they're using that phase change process to cool the rest of the water to circulate through the suit. So he's got a limited supply of water. Once it's all gone, he doesn't stay cool anymore. And, but, you know, around the space station, it's no big deal because they ship water up there all the time. It's a low Earth orbit uh, launch to do that. But if you're going to Mars, there's nothing more precious to you than water. And you can't just vent that out in space and stay cool. And so look, they're looking at closed circuit systems, which is what this is. So that's pretty exciting also. Um, <clears throat> you'll know the comment I, I, down at the bottom here. I work with the uh, College of uh, Law here at CQ's University with their marketing group uh, to look to, to try to explore <coughs> further either what other markets might be uh, receptive to this type of technology, or more specifics about these particular markets, what are their market requirements, what are they looking for in the fall. But in general, it's very opposite to this. Talk a little bit about the design of the compressor itself. Uh, we, do have, uh, we do have patent applications on file, both uh, US and international. Uh, we believe there are at least five different inventions involved in this at the moment, which can be carved out through divisionals. But one, two, there's two key aspects of this, this design. One of them is what I call a uniaxial design. If you look at the machine components, you look at the way the components assemble together. And so in essence, I can build this machine by just having a pallet. I have a little small pallet in front of me, and I start stacking stuff on top of each other, like building up a layer cake. And at the end, I push a shell over it, and I've got a complete, completely simple compressor. Over uh, here, there it is. For a uh, show and tell, I brought one of our test compressors with me today. I'm going to pass some carts around and we have a look at uh, If you want to look at some of this stuff, I'll be happy to show you. I've got the uh, shell, which is the shell see up here. Drive system and then the small pair. The shell doesn't have to be that. What you're going to see here is much larger than the machine needs to be. Uh, this is what we call the camera alpha and a beta design concept. Uh, and this is designed mainly to be bulletproof, easy to work with, easy to take apart, work with the lens. It's a development vehicle. 
But the core of this thing is the actual scroll set. It runs together, the two spirals that intermesh with each other, the drive system, and the power system. Uh, I'm looking ahead now, now a little on the gamma design, which is more of a production oriented design. Uh, we're looking at reducing the diameter of that. I don't know if you've lost the if you look, if you look at the when you see the fixed wall come around, if you look at the inside diameter, that'll be the outside diameter of the press. It will shrink it down by about half of an inch diameter, and, and, and proportionally the weight also. So, but the uniaxial design, it, once again, the whole point is this machine is very easy to build. If I'm building in low quantities, low volumes, and low volumes might be on the order of a thousand a year in, in, in my industry. Uh, I can have one person sitting at a table with a, with a few, with, with, a, with a pallet, a few little tools, and they just build a personal all day, set them together. If I want to go to high volume, where now I'm measuring it in integrals of millions of compressors, uh, it's no trick at all to have a very simple, uh, very simple robot, very simple automation to do this assembly for me and put it together. So either way, as we ramp up volume, we go from very, very low volume, one z two z operation to high one z two z million operation. Uh, the design is very receptive to being easy to build and being fit and, and fairly quick. So that's the first part. The second part is what I'm calling strategic precision. Uh, a number of you have already asked me about scroll compressors. If you, if you hear anything about them at all, one thing you always hear about scrolls is they got to be super stupidly precise. You've got to have Tons is down to the Nats eyelash to get these things to go together and work properly. And in many ways, that's true. It's very true. But if you look at many commercial products on the market today, some of that precision is in the scroll wraps themselves. A lot of that precision is in the drive system, keeping things aligned and just exactly oriented properly. In this particular design, what I've been able to achieve is I've been able to push almost all of that precision into two scroll components, the lower and fixed scroll. Uh, the drive system, it's a, it's a fairly novel drive system that we're using. Uh, it's, fairly in, it's fairly insensitive to misalignment, small degrees of misalignment, and small degrees of tolerance variation. Uh, so I can have this thing fairly loose. I can have, instead of having tolerances on the order of, uh, alignment tolerances on the order of uh, a thousandth to half a thousandth, which is what many machines on the market today do and achieve, I didn't have conventional machine tolerances of a Bridgeport mill of three or four thousandths tolerance, and the machine will operate equally as well. I don't need to worry about that. What I do need to worry about is the scroll pair itself. That still needs to be stupidly precise, and parts have to be exactly matched to each other. As these parts go around, you may notice that if you look at the tips of the spirals on both these parts, they're both polished, they have almost a mirror finish on them. And what that means is those things are matched to within a micron of each other. They're exactly the same height and when they come together, that's how I get to seal it between pockets is from the tip to floor contact on both sides but it has to happen at the same time. It is not possible, it is not possible in any kind of practical sense to do that with CNC building equipment. I can get it very close to that, but you cannot achieve that. The machine will not, if I just pull, pull these machines off of the mill, off of the machine tool and try to build it, the machine will not perform. In fact, it may not even load up. So I still need I still need to build I still need precision, but now I've, I've restricted the precision to just a couple of parts in the compressor. The rest of them can be fairly wide open. So it's, it's a cost challenge. Uh, right now, the parts you see in front of the parts you're looking at, the parts I'm showing on the screen here, uh, we do machine them. I have a machine shop out to east of here that uh, a precision shop that's making this for me, and they make them as best they can, and they're good within a thousand to maybe less than a thousandth of an inch. Not good enough, but it's close. <clears throat> right now, that, that, that set of scrolls I'm passing on here is about $2,400. And that's just coming coming out of the mill before I do anything to it. <clears throat> right now, what it requires is the, these parts required to be matched to each other. Right? You know, they come out of the mill, and I've got this situation. I've got to somehow run these into each other so they match exactly. And so I have the process where I can do that, and I've done a 12 out of 12 so far, but it's done by hand, it's very laborious, it's very uh, time intensive, it's messy, uh, 
it takes a lot of it, it takes a lot of judgment. I got kind of parts. Does that look right yet? Or maybe put it over here and test it. And it's uh, it works. I can do it. But you don't want to produce them that way. You can't produce them that way. So it's it's very high right now. The cost is very very high. It requires a fair amount of skill, labor, and judgment in doing it. And any process that requires labor and judgment and a lot of skill to do it, uh, it's an uncontrolled process. Basically, I'm just doing something to them and watching as it comes in. If I look so good, I send them off. So it's not it's not a very controllable process the way it is right now. That's how we are. Also, if I'm looking ahead on cost, okay, I said gee, these things are like twenty-four hundred dollars for the pair you're looking at. I talked to a few companies already, one in particular out west who works with scroll equipment, scroll types of machinery. Mm -hmm. And these are some these numbers are not exactly representative, but uh, for some investment fixed tooling, uh, I can now instead of twenty four hundred dollars, I can these things for about one tenth of that cost, maybe two hundred fifty dollars for a scroll. <coughs> That's a small quantities. I'm doing one of these these days, or maybe even a few dozen, or even a few hundred. Okay, but I'm still getting parts off the mill. I can't run. I still have to do the finishing process. But at least I've got a path forward to start getting some of the cost along with the chain. But precision in, in any product in the world today, period, precision equals cost. The more precise you want to be, the more it's going to cost. And so I'm trying to achieve here is no cost precision. So, starting last fall, we're doing that. If I look at commercializing this compressor, uh, th there are many obstacles, many things to overcome. But unless we can get this finishing process down to something that's low cost, repeatable, and easy to do, there's no point in looking at the rest of it. There's no point in that. And so starting last fall, working with Syracuse University, I'm sponsoring, Bush Tech will sponsor a capstone project, if you're familiar with that. Basically uh, funding a, uh, senior class design team as part of their senior design project to look at uh, various things for various industries and in my case i said hey i need a finishing machine i need to i can tell you i can tell you how i do this today i can tell you what types of things it takes to run this together but i've got no process i've got no machine to do it and so starting last september uh we got together a senior design team and we're doing exactly that we're almost finished i think next week we're wrapping up uh, watching the picture you see here is the uh, prototype machine as it is today. Uh, I think it's going to be a bit further along in a week or so. They're, they're scrambling, they're the turn, scrambling to get this done. But it's uh, the objective is kind of similar, I'm calling it semi automated at this point. The idea being I can load this thing up, I can lock it up, I can turn it on, and I can watch my, I can watch my watch or use a timer and control a few variables. The parts come back out ready to run. I don't need to be looking at them. I don't need to uh, judge whether they're ready to go or not. I know if I do a certain process at a certain speed, a certain direction, a certain period of time, a certain type of grace of media, the parts will be ready to go. So now, if I look at load lines, okay, I've got something I can, uh, we, we can actually do now. Okay, instead of taking an hour for a scroll set to get it into stride, which I'm happy with them, you know, maybe five, ten minutes. You've got five or ten minutes per, per set. When the process works, you know, what you see here is kind of a screwed together prototype machine made up of director set on type parts. But the core of it, the core of it is the is the magic in there. But this one makes I've got load them just the right way and run them just the right way to get it together. Once that's established, once I have this process parameters in place, <coughs> do a little high line process for one of the millions of these, it's really not too big a step. It has a little bit of external automation, how is the machine put together, how do I load parts and other parts. But the core process is done, so the low volume, the high volume. Uh, and I have a little bit of an acknowledgement here. Uh, this is a Syracuse uh, Center of Excellence. This has been the uh, recipient of one of the Innovation Fund Awards. And so this is being done in conjunction with Center of Excellence in that regard and has helped enable this uh, enable the project. And what you see here is pretty much the work output of this. Now, we haven't actually run a scroll set yet, so I'm not quite bragging too much, but so far things look very promising. For us. Okay. If anybody's in town uh, Monday, we have the uh, Senior Design Poster Project. It's part of the wrap-up of the term. We'll be down in the uh, atrium of the Life Sciences Building on the main campus, and this is just a preview draft of the poster they'll be presenting. 
and the machine will also be there on the table to look at and uh, and check out. So please please stop by if you're up for it, if you're up to it and, and are around for it. So I'm looking so looking long term. If from the time that we have this machine is performing the micro ECS, you see there's good performance, you really say, wow, hey, battery's running this thing. Uh, what needs to be done to commercialize this? <coughs> well, first thing is proof of concept. We've got another machine that even works in the first place. That's done. <coughs> That's done. We know the machine works. We've got to make it work. We can build any number of them again and make more of them work. Not very cheap or fast, but we can do it. It's, it's very doable. We've got to pass that hurdle. Once you know something can be done, the rest of it starts to become a lot easier. Uh, second thing, capstone project. Okay, that's the toughest challenge, the biggest uh, obstacle to commercializing the design, is to have a good, reliable, repeatable production process that does not require training and skilled labor that I can teach a technician to do and put on a production basis. And that's what this is. That's in progress. It's almost complete. After that. Uh, when I start looking now, adapting this compressor to a portable system where I'm now using outdoor air and an air-cooled type condenser situation where I might be getting very wide, have very wide variations of condensing temperature, I need to know a lot more about how the compressor performs. All, almost all the testing we've done for the microsystem has been at a very narrow temperature range. We know our office temperature is within uh, a very, you know, 65 to 75 degrees, maybe 80, which is a very narrow range for this type of system. You know, the, the uh, cooling cool side is exactly on 65 degrees, plus or minus a little bit. So it's very stable, very narrow condition. In order to widen this thing out, we run across a lot of conditions to know how to adjust compressor speed and modulate capacity and even how compressor performs. So this is the process now. You know, I picked a uh, girl D here. I uh, hired a uh, co-op from Syracuse University, the junior, in the student and he is doing a lot of this chrome semantic for me. We're using the test stand upstairs. We're testing beta hardware right now. We'll be testing some alpha hardware soon to get a comparison. And basically doing performance maps. I'm running over a wide range of condensing conditions. I'm running across a wide range of speed variation and starting to map out how the compressor works over, over this uh, broader, broader sense. So that's in process now also. I also need I also need now to uh, design a scroll set that will work in this uh, more demanding environment. The first two you see here, uh, I've got three three cartoons here on the screen. The first two are the uh, two compressors that we use in this project. The first prototype we'll call the Alpha had a fairly low volume ratio, very fairly low compression ratio. Those are the compressors once again because we're running very demanding condition. That's all we really need. And so that, we test that, we do a few things, hey, we might want to go with higher volume ratio on beta compressors. It'll look like this, and as you go higher and higher volume ratio, you see two things happening here. You see the racks being a little more twisty, I've got have more turns in there to bring the ratio down. But also my discharge port is shrinking down. Uh, so <clears throat> what we're going to have again is going as high as 2.5, that's about the limit we think we can go to within this base plate. And maintain our discharge port area, but it gets us closer now to the conditions we need to run to do desert conditions or other types of conditions. Once again, I have another student, uh, Julie Zalesta, who's been pretty modeling for me and working again to design, hopefully, testing some of these graphs in the fairly near future and see how they perform. <coughs> After that, uh, it becomes, I have some other things here. There's probably a bit of a long list now below this, but it becomes more routine, more doable. Everything here is totally good. But before we invest too much in this, we need to get past these other aspects. So we need to uh, start looking at the final bearings, especially motor source selection. Uh, right now, we're using, the motors we're using today, the bearings are perfectly good for our testing, but after a thousand hours of operation, they may not hold up so well. All their so we have some work to do to at least specify those bearings, come up with a custom design system with the motor. Uh, and we have to come up with this in the manufacturing process. Is this an uh, open design, closed design? How do we seal it? And But these are all very solvable problems. But these are the ones working on now, the ones that we've got to get past those things before it becomes a really commercial design. <coughs> and so that is where the compressor is today. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you for hosting, hosting us here, and uh, hope we work with this a bit longer. Thank you. Thank you.
now batting cleanup. Is there another slide deck that we got to tee up? Is Mike Wetzel. Mike, Mike is uh, president and CEO of Air Innovations. Um, so a position he's been in for 22 years. He started in 1996. Um, and when he <clears throat> became president and CEO, Air Innovations was making one product. It was a personal environmental control system for flowers, or floral display in um, in supermarkets. And Mike has uh, has grown grown the company. Um, they now address a wide variety of refrigeration, air conditioning, and filtration needs for a broad range of applications, from um, military to high tech to wine cellars. And Mike, Mike has a degree in mechanical engineering from Clarkson University. He's a professional engineer. He's the holder of uh, seven patents. Mike Wetzel. By the way, advance this chat. Right button. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, I want everybody to take a moment and picture yourself at work. Picture yourself sitting at your desk and ask yourself, how often are you actually comfortable? Not too hot, not too cold. What about the people around you? How often do you hear people in your office say, oh, it's a little chilly in here now all of a sudden. Is it now? Somebody turn the thermostat down? Or I'm getting a little hot over here, right? So I'm mean, I bet you every single person in this room, everybody who's joining us by webinar, <coughs> welcome. Um, here's that every day or experiences that every day. So imagine if you actually had complete control over that space around you at will. At any point in time during the day, you can make it just a little bit warmer, just a little bit cooler. Turn the system on, turn the system off. Everybody around you had that ability to add absolute control over the environment that is very specific to you. You'd have the ability to change your temperature with no impact on somebody sitting immediately next to you, or vice versa. If you've got Ez sitting next to you, he wants to be 92 degrees all the time. He told us he comes from Egypt. I don't like 92 degrees. So I could be a little colder, he could be a little warmer, and we won't impact each other at all. So ask yourself, would you be much happier at work? Would your employees be happier at work? Or here's the big question, would we be more productive at work? And what if you own the building? So today, buildings are all designed by a central wall-mounted thermostat. Somewhere in this room, there's a sensor that says, oh, this is what we're going to set this whole room at. That sensor that's on that wall is entirely blind to occupants. It has no idea. It doesn't know if this room is filled with 30 people as it is here right now, or it's just me here practicing this whole speech. It has no idea. So the way our buildings work today is we essentially spend the same amount of money cooling the building if it's entirely full of people, as in this photo here, or if there's only one person in that building. Go in there on a weekend, on a Saturday, it's going to spend the same amount of money, turn the whole air conditioning system up, and this whole giant office that you see there in that picture for the sake of, uh, of only one person. So by individualizing environmental control by taking it to the individual we can actually change the way we will manage <coughs> buildings we can raise our set points in the summer we can lower them in the winter and by making those adjustments to the central system it seems pretty obvious to everyone i'm sure that you can have a potential savings that's quite significant see one of the things that wasn't taken into consideration when arpa issued the challenge is they essentially make the assumption that building is full what about when there's only one person in that building? Think about the energy impact at that point in time by raising that building and only having to turn on a cooling system for one person. In addition to that, and as touched on this briefly, um, we have a lot of problems in the US with certain large municipalities. We've all heard of rolling blackouts in California. New York City has a very significant issue, and it's not even just this power plant. Forget taking a power plant offline and supplies 30% of the city. They currently have 
a problem on peak power days. The city owns 16 peakers, they call them. These are power plants that are only run a handful of times a year for only a handful of hours. If you look in the lower right on this photo, you'll see one of those peakers. If you look really closely, what you'll notice that seems rather odd is it's on water. That's a power plant sitting on a barge in the river in New York City. Draw your own conclusions on that one, but that seems like an environmental problem. So these plants are only run a couple times a year, a couple days a year, maybe a week a year. Um, probably varies by which peaker they have to turn on. But imagine the cost of keeping that maintained all year long, ready to run at a moment's notice when the thermometer hits the right number in August. You have to have that ready all year long. Someone's in there doing maintenance on it, they're testing it, they're missions, maybe they don't have the same mission standards, uh, but that's a real problem in New York City. And it is a problem in lots of our cities around the world. We have high densities in these urban areas and we just can't keep up on these peak loading days. So with that as a background, ARPA-E and also NYSERDA, who's also um, involved in this project to an extent, issued those challenges. And, the, and, and as did hit it, I'll just repeat, their challenge was to try to keep, we have to come up with a system to keep occupants comfortable with a four degree shift in the thermostat, generating over 500 watt hours of cooling and consuming less than 65 watts. If we can do that, we have a giant opportunity to save money on HVAC systems. So I wanna introduce you to the ME1000. This is a personal microenvironment. Sits under your desk, provides conditioned air directly to the user at will and on demand. So far we've completed two prototypes, as Ed's pointed out, one is sitting here in front of me, in front of all of you, um, to prove out the technology. And our prototypes have both exceeded our expectations. It works. So I'll give you a little overview of how it works. <coughs> At night, when the building is unoccupied, we turn on a compressor. We suck air in through the unit to cool the compressor. So we will exhaust heated air to that building space at night when the building is unoccupied. We need to do this because we're running a vapor compression system to freeze the phase change material. So it's a mechanical process we have to generate. heat. We freeze it just like you'd freeze a block of ice, except for this phase change material freezes at 68 degrees. It takes about eight to nine hours to complete the freezing and then the unit shuts off. Our power consumption during this process is 12 watts. And that's happening at night. A lot of advantages at night. Energy costs are the cheapest. It's also colder outside. Your building might actually be in heating mode at night. And we're giving a little bit of a bump to the space. During the day, we've got this frozen material Imagine a block of ice, frozen phase change, just sitting there ready to use. All we need is a variable speed fan. The user can turn it on, turn it off, turn it up, turn it down, entirely at will, completely at will to the individual at the desk, not predicated by a central thermostat on the wall. This system, as you see in front of me, <clears throat> as configured, will provide 500 watt hours of cooling, which is enough to cool the air that's going through it eight degrees for eight to 10 hours. Compressor's not running, so we're not making any noise, we're not making any heat, we're just running one fan. The total energy consumption of that fan is one watt, which means 100 desks could be run off of a single traditional incandescent light bulb, well, maybe 100 watt light bulb, that is. So that's pretty amazing that you could run 100 of those units in a peak energy demand day, keep somebody cool for the energy cost of a light bulb. So where are we at? We now understand the technology is there. We've got the proof of concept in front of us. The next phase that I see it, um, that we are marching down, <coughs> is we're looking for additional grants and opportunities to support a larger field trial. And we're looking for some facilities to do that field trial. 
See, one of the concerns I have is we haven't done much to determine the right size of the unit. So our, our, all of our math and all of our prototypes and all of our units today are based on ARPRA-E's challenge, as it should be. They did the math. They said, this is the goal. We want you to meet that goal. And this unit works. It provides eight to 10 hours of cooling. How often do you sit at your desk for 10 hours? So that's the challenge because the size, the physical size of the unit, you can see in front of me, it's quite large. And it is due to the phase change material. 75 to 80% of that unit is a block of phase change material. If we only needed four hours of cooling or five hours of cooling, we need half as much phase change. Imagine what the form factor is, entirely different. So it's it, before we move on to spending money to commercialize a product and take the product to market, we have to know that we're actually taking the right product to market at this stage. That may evolve again. Again, our is guessing we want to change every building in the country, raise the thermostat, stick these at every desk. That may not be the early adopter. In fact, I would reckon that it won't be the early adopters. So our next task is to right-size this thing and determine that. And to determine that, we need to get some field trials and watch how people actually use the unit. Does it get used three hours a day, four hours a day? I'm willing to bet, based on just listening in my own office, that in the middle of the day or early morning, somebody might actually have theirs on heating while somebody else next to them is on cooling. Think about it, right? As, as said, little heaters under the desk. People are running them right now. Even we're moving, starting to move to air conditioning. So that's our next phase. And then after that, I think we move to commercialization. Um, where might we envision selling this unit? Well, <laughs> one of the challenges you have with an early phase commercialization project is that we aren't fully mature yet. We don't have Bill Bush's compressor available to you yet. It's not a commercial product. Um, we can't go and build hundreds of thousands of these to drive the price down, whereby it would make economic sense purely based on the energy it saves. So some of the markets that we will be chasing is obviously stressed municipalities. So those that have these energy problems, they are incentivized by more than just money. They have a serious problem. And some of them, like New York City, has a very serious problem with a power plant going down, coming at it. Um, Historical buildings is interesting because historical buildings don't have the ability to upgrade their HVAC and they are usually woeful, woefully lacking in capacity. And another really interesting one we're going to start chasing is employee centric companies, Googles of the world, who are willing to invest to retain the best talent they can get. And they will spend a lot of money to bring features and, um, and drive employee benefits and environmental. I mean, they'll, they, you see them with, they're the always the ones that try the newest chairs. So um, we believe the employee-centric companies is, is also a, a great place to chase. Um, so now I want to give you a little, just a brief background on Air Innovations as to why we might be the right partner to take this product to market. Um, as Ed said, uh, we've been at this for over 30 years. We've been building, uh, I have not quite for 30 years, companies this is a little bit before. Um, we've been building specialty HVAC systems for a huge range of applications, but dominantly not comfort cool, because those aren't very special, right? So you've got large corporations that build big rooftop systems. That's not what we do. We focus on the niche markets, and this product is, is clearly at this stage is a, uh, is a niche product. Um, our largest brand that we build today is Wine Guardian cooling systems for uh, residential and commercial sellers. I, I want to thank Ez for allowing me to use a photo of his wine cellar. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ez. <laughs> yeah, so we, we do, we build about uh, 60 units a week for wine cellars. Um, we are pr pretty close to being the uh, largest wine cellar producer in the world. Uh, we sell around 45, we sell to 45 different countries around the world. We have a sales office in Switzerland. And as I said, we build about 60 of these a week. If anybody wants to come to the factory, it's fun to watch these. This is the closest thing we have to a high volume production line, which in the HVAC world is still extremely low volumes. But it shows our ability to ramp up uh, as a product grows. As I said, it's about half our business. The other half of our business is a combination of custom units that we do for a variety of applications and work we do for other manufacturers. Just a good sampling of some of the custom units that we've done in the last couple of years that are 
kind of we like to talk about kind of our marquee projects. On the left here is uh, Caesar's Palace, uh, the world's largest Ferris wheel, uh, 550 feet high. Each one of those balls you see hanging on that um, ring is uh, you'll see the picture of the inside of it on your lower left. Those cabins hold 40 people each. So everybody in this room would easily fit into one cabin. There's 28 of them flying around 550 feet, uh, all glass, Las Vegas sun. You can might understand why they needed HVAC systems there. Um, we have uh, five levels of redundancy uh, inside that was why we did it. On the right is something even more crazy is uh, stuff that we do for aerospace. Our unit you can see with a guy in the orange vest there standing next to our unit, which is actually being um, trailered directly behind a rocket. Our job is to, to protect the payload of that rocket. And we've done this for uh, most of the launch complexes already here in the US. And in fact, in our facility right now, we're building a unit for South Korea for the exact same application. Our job is to protect the satellite while, while it's on the ground prior to launch. Go forward. And uh, for OEMs is another big part of our business. So these are themselves manufacturers. So we sell a component to a manufacturer. In the upper left is a product we do for um, baggage screen for Homeland Security. So this, this goes into airports. This screens your luggage for explosives. If you ever got one of those little tickets inside your bag that says you've been hand checked, your bag's been hand checked, that's because this machine right there thought your, your uh, cheese ball that was in your bag was a bomb and um, it decided that it needed to go through further inspection. Every one of those units has one of our systems in it. You can see that <coughs> pictured in the, in the box actually is inside the unit. We protect the sensitive electronics inside that unit. In the upper right is a typical semiconductor client of ours. Um, they build a machine that goes into wafer fabs all around the world, the Samsungs, the Motorola's, the IBM's of the world. Um, for that client, we control temperature to plus or minus three hundredths of a degree C. So inside that chamber, temperature does not move more than plus or minus 0 0.03 C from set point. And in the middle, we've done some aerospace projects as well as some other works for pharmaceutical and um, some other OEMs. And the last relevant application is our current microenvironments. As touched on this briefly, it's been about, for about three years now, we've been building personal microenvironments for the 24 seven uh, mission critical industries. These are 911 um, insurance call centers, DOT call center, air traffic, places that are manned 24 seven and have lots of monitors as you see pictured here. On the lower right, you see our current unit. That's the ME200. That unit provides cooling to the operator via a ventilation fan. There's no active cooling, there's no phase change. We're not doing anything to lower the temperature of the air. We are literally just blowing air at them as you would a desk fan. Below the desks, they have heating that they blow at their feet. On top of that, we do a variety of other environmental things such as control all the lighting that's at the desk, task lighting and any other lighting. Maybe they have and on lighting to signal a supervisor they need help and desk heights. So we essentially, control all of the environmental and ergonomic factors um, for that desk, including cooling. So you can understand our interest in this project to use the ME1000 with phase change to start to grow this portfolio, this product, this brand. Um, we see a great opportunity to do, start to, to step off of this, adding into new um, niche markets and, and other early adopters. So that's where we see things going. Um, I, of course, I have to end this with a, uh, uh, a special thanks to Ez. <laughs> and I have to uh, congratulate you on all of your great work and wish you all the best in your retirement and may the burgundy flow off. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Uh, as this presentation, uh, quick one, is the PCM non-toxic? It's non-toxic, yeah. Uh, I was just checking the MSDS. It says, if you drink it and inhale it, you're in trouble. If you asphyxiate, that's, uh, other than that, there was nothing
And continuous exposure to the skin could be lead, lead to dryness or something. Mm -hmm. They actually thought about using glycerol, which you can't take. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't freeze uh, on the fluids. So it doesn't break. Yeah. What is the refrigerant? The refrigerant is a, a, a floral, floral uh, I mean, a hydrofloral olefin is called R1233ZD. Okay, with an E at the end. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, by the way, okay, the uh, initial introduction that Mike will have, will have to use an off-the-shelf compressor, and these were run on things like 134A, so it's a much denser refrigerant, so for uh, early introduction. But for the scroll and this unit here, we use that 1233ZD with an E, capital E, between parentheses. Yeah. Uh, Volker? Well, congratulations. Wonderful. Uh, it seems to me that it's a real interesting optimization problem to find the right temperature phase change material and other physical properties of the phase change material. Mm -hmm. uh, would water work? Yes, uh, uh, probably. Uh, but yeah, but water freezes at zero energy. degrees. Okay, well, we actually, okay, water is a wonderful <laughs> substance. It's safe, it's cheap, it's available. Yeah. But it freezes at zero degrees Celsius. Okay, uh, it has actually a fairly significant latent heat. The latent heat of fusion of that that uh, PCM we're using is 250 kilojoules per kilogram. Water is 334, right. so it's better. Okay, but uh, if you were to freeze it at zero degrees, you're going to use a lot more power to freeze it because right. the COP will be a lot lower. Furthermore, we wanted to select a PCM that does not freeze below the dew point of the moisture in the air. So I specifically selected this one because it freezes around 65 degrees. How, what's the spectrum of uh, those uh, phase change materials now available? Well, okay, there are a number of them, but if you look at this range of temperature we're looking for, there are very few of them. Uh -huh. Some of them are inorganic salts, are highly corrosive, since the aluminum coil we have, the coil we have in the middle, is made of aluminum. There's one that we were looking at at the beginning. It was mostly uh, calcium chloride. Okay, you know the the stuff you throw in your driveway to melt the ice. It would have eaten the aluminum tube in no time. Okay, uh, the manufacturer said it's made of calcium chloride and uh, and uh, secret secret ingredients. <laughs> okay, so we cannot even get it. In because uh, use it because yes, it's here. We have a barrel of it, but we never used it. Okay, uh, the other okay, the other materials, but the inorga the organic ones okay, tend to be less corrosive, but they have a very low thermal conductivity. So part of the challenge in the design is how do you accommodate? I mean that big thing here. If you okay, this is much bigger than a fifteen hundred watt air conditioning system is because of the low thermal conductivity of the PCM we have to provide a very large surface area to be able to freeze it so we have these big coils 16 passes the tube each tube in one of these things is more than six meters long You don't want to have a puddle of water under your desk. And uh, <laughs> the compressor will never generate condensate either because that would be a little problem. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have a, a comment and question from Jim Luckett. Yes. Uh, he said, fascinating and fantastic. Home run potential. Congratulations, Ed, Bill, Mike, and the entire team, Ed and Syracuse DOE. And then he asked, is the RPE funded project complete at this point, or is it supporting some of the commercialization steps the, as well? The, no, the original uh, RPE project was supposed to end in the end of this month, like next week. Okay, But we got a no-cost extension for another three months. 
because we wanted to do some human subject testing during the warm months. We have done the human subject testing at Cornell, but was in the late fall. Okay, so we wanted to do additional testing during the summer months. So we asked for a no cost extension. We got it. July, end of July is when the project ends. Uh, I'd like to introduce Don Carr, who's sitting in the back. These nice designs that you saw in Mike's presentation were, were prepared by uh, Professor Carr, who was a, was a professor of design at Syracuse University. Yes. Uh, I have a comment from Joe Borowick from NYSERDA. Yeah. He says, excellent work by all. Invite the team to NYSERDA discuss next steps and how nice sort of could help. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. We are ready. Joe, we are ready, Joe. Well, yes, yes, Bill. Has there been any initial discussions with furniture manufacturers? I could just see the phase change Mike? material be part of the actual desk and everything like that. Okay. Yeah, we have started a little of that. It's it's a little difficult because we don't, without really knowing how to right size this thing, it's really hard to communicate with them because they really need to they need to be a little further down the pipeline. But our other uh, product, our existing ME two hundred, is sold to technical desk market. That's who is our buyer. So it's not the furniture names you know, but they are furniture manufacturers nonetheless. Um, we've also um, been put in touch with um, a retired. Um, uh, Vice President of Research for one of the three largest furniture companies in the world. I'm not at liberty to say who. Um, and who is very interested in helping us as we advance this project along. So I, I think you're absolutely correct that for us, it's, we are not going to try to necessarily sell this to all these end users. That's a very difficult distribution pathway. The furniture makers would be a much better and a much easier pathway. But I think we need to be further along. We need to understand the right size because right now it's quite a large object and with today's today's shift is everybody sits we just redid all of our offices and all of our desks are sit stand so that throws another twist into this whole thing are we going to pick this thing up and down are we going to have dark work hanging off of this and so and everything gets easier if we can be half the size yeah i just so. want to give credit to because his design has a telescoping duct in it, okay? And actually you design it to allow uh, these, these desks that you can raise and lower, okay? So it's possible to uh, accommodate this. And uh, Bill, if you're looking at integrating the PCM and the furniture itself rather than the PCM heat exchanger, I don't know how to do it because we need to transfer heat into oh, the PCM. Have to have the heat I have to have the heat well, exchanger, yeah. okay? So integrating the actual heat exchanger in the furniture, that's more uh, more practical than thinking about integrating the actual PCM and the, and the furniture. Is the air diffusion adjustable or is it a fixed? Uh, uh, it's like a car diffuser. If you look at it, it looks like a car diffuser. Double so plate, people, uh, yeah, the, the double veins, I mean, the louvers yeah. that you can move up and down and left and right because I mean, you can have tall people, short people, fat right. people, thin people, whatever. People will sit close and far, so we allow exactly the same kind of adjustment you have in a, in a car. Great. Mm -hmm. Yes? I have a question. So this is a fabulous collaboration, and the work is amazing, and the product has so much amazing potential. Who, when it comes to commercialization, owns the product? Who, the, who benefits mm -hmm. from the sale? Of the manufacturer. The product. original patent is in my name, okay, but it would be licensed to uh, uh, Air Innovation or Carrier if Carrier wants to make it in large volumes or anybody, okay. Our partners, both United Technologies and Air Innovation, have the right to first use it. Okay? Well, then that would help us sell the market. <laughs> And the answer is the same, exact same answer for professor, we have to go check for what's posted. Mm -hmm. Yes, with the ocean of that. This is Syracuse University, yes, it's, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Uh, something outside the personal system, I call it battery power systems, 
that's a, it's a separate thing. thing. Yeah. Okay, but uh, Mike, I promise that if you pay royalties for a very large number of units, I use whatever I get to equip my wine cellar. <laughs> John, how, how quiet is this uh, union? How, excuse me? Quiet, yeah. Very, very quiet. The compressor does not run while a person <coughs> is sitting at the desk. The only thing that runs when a person is sitting at the desk is one watt fan. It's the very, very, we cannot hear it. Even the compressor, as, as Bill mentioned, when the compressor is running, this is one of the advantages of score compressors that are much more balanced than piston compressors and rolling piston compressors. The compressor is very quiet even at night. Okay. The sound, the sound the compressor makes is it's, it's very similar to the sound that your refrigerator mm -hmm. might make in your kitchen, mm -hmm. but the noise level is very, very low. You have to kind of get some kids with the kitchen. Then, in any case, it, it turns at night. It does not run while somebody is sitting at the desk. So, at this point, I'm going to suggest that we enact. <laughs> The toast is out in the hallway. There are some refreshments to celebrate the accomplishment of this team. And as is uh, contributions to our community over the last 17 years, I thank the folks who joined us on the, on the web, especially for, uh, for their questions. And uh, thank you all for attending. <laughs>